And I'll begin reading in verse 57, Matthew 26. Then those who seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest. And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none. Though many false witnesses came forward, at last two came forward and said, this man I am able to destroy, said, I am able to, this man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild in three days. The high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, You have said so, but I tell you, from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his robes and said, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You've now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. And they spit in his face and struck him, and some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Let's have prayer together. Father in heaven, we bow at this time, and we do pray for your blessing upon the preached word, as it has been read now, with the Spirit of God, Oh, please, Father, move within my heart to produce the words that must be delivered. And would those who hear be anointed so that those words would be planted deeply into fertile soil within human hearts. Save sinners and strengthen your saints, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we're in the Passion Week leading up to the death of Christ. We've come through Gethsemane. We've seen the betrayal the hands of Judas, one of the twelve. And now the trial begins. He is before the Sanhedrin. And it begins. The Sanhedrin is the Supreme Court of Judea. They have civil and religious authority. And here he is tried on blasphemy charges before they hand him over to the Romans to crucify him. In this text, I hope you'll leave the church today. I hope you'll leave church today seeing that Jesus is innocent of all sin, he's never sinned. It comes through in the trial, the show trial. I hope you will leave today understanding that this court that pronounced judgment on Jesus was guilty, and it was really this court that was on trial. And I hope you leave today understanding that Jesus, in the pressure of the moment, maintains his composure, his focus, he's cool keeps his head, and throughout the whole ordeal, he's really the immovable man. He's full of faith and love, courage, and he has now emerged from Gethsemane. The prayer in Gethsemane, he has now emerged from Gethsemane as our champion. He's on a mission, and his mission is to die and bear our sins. He's our sin bearer. So I hope you leave the service today in more awe of Christ, seeing him as even more lovely. I hope you leave the church today with hearts that can appreciate even more how much worthy he is to be worshipped, and that you will worship him even more fully for having seen his character come through in this ordeal and see his focus upon the crucifixion, the mission that God's given him, to see how immovable he is, how much faith he has, and see how he's emerged from Gethsemane as our champion, the one who died for us with a heart of love for his elect. Break it up into three sections today. We'll talk about the scene that develops here, describe the scene. We'll look at the charge that's brought against Christ in this mock trial, and then we'll see the response. 
The scene, the charge, the response. It's all here. But let's look at the scene. Jesus is led to the Sanhedrin in verse 57. Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. This is the Sanhedrin council. Caiaphas is the one that has united the plot. We know that from chapter 26, verse 3. He is the chief priest, the high priest. He is elected by the ruling class, and I suspect at many points in the election of individuals like Caiaphas in those days, there was a lot of backroom deals and bribery involved, given how evil these men were. And he is the chief representative of the nation. If if the Sanhedrin represents the nation politically, and religiously, he is the representative of the Sanhedrin. So, so he is the representative of the nation. He has more power in the nation than any other man. He married the daughter of the previous high priest, and he was well-connected and enjoyed a life of privilege. He oversaw all the sacrifices in the temple. He was the only one permitted in the Holy of Holies. And then beyond that, he profited more than anyone else off the sales of the of the sacrifices in the temple and after the money changers. So you remember Jesus drove out the money changers and he drove out the sales of the sacrifices in the temple. Well, yes, that offended Caiaphas because he thought that he was the one who was in charge of that, but I think also it hurt him at the bottom line. So, so Jesus hasn't just hurt his pride, he's hurt his pocketbook. So this is a man that is used to being in charge and Jesus has an ax to, or he has an ax to grind with Jesus. Because Jesus is cramping his style, you could say. He's a political and religious powerhouse. And Jesus has now hit a few nerves. And he's more than hit the nerves, he's he's danced on them. And pinched them. So Caiaphas is angry and Jesus is brought into Caiaphas. When it says in our text in verse 57, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. This is the religious leaders, the Old Testament lawyers. When we hear the scribes. Talking about lawyers, students in Old Testament law. They've convened and here they've waited for Jesus, knowing that they'd sent Judas out to find him and capture him. Judas had led a mob to come and capture Jesus. And so this mob came to fetch Jesus and all these power brokers are waiting back, um, are waiting for Jesus to come with his captors. Did Judas get the prize? Did Judas bring us our trophy? Did Judas get the man that we asked him to get? Is he good on the money we paid him? And by the way, this is late at night, and this is a holiday. And this is the most busy time of year for these men because it's the Passover. This is their time to shine. When everyone comes to Jerusalem to the temple to do business with the priests. And so this is their busiest time of the year. And this is late on the evening of the busiest season, between the two busiest days. Past midnight likely now. And the fact that these men were willing to give up their sleep to meet so late at night tells me how much they hated Christ. And their hatred of Christ at this point is is much more insidious, I should say much deeper than than the disciples' love of Christ. Because the disciples were not willing to give up their sleep to pray, but these men were willing to give up their sleep to put Christ on a show trial. This ought to tell you something. When you're too tired for Christ, and you're too tired to pray, and you're too tired to get up in the morning and do your business with God, I want you to know that while you're sleeping and you're hitting snooze on your alarm, that the devil's not too tired to attack your family. And the devil's not too tired to be secretly plotting how to bring down your home and to bring down our church and to bring down this society. So don't miss your times of prayer. Don't miss your times with the Lord. Don't be too tired to pray like the disciples were. Because the devil's never too tired to bring down God's people. And he'll take any chance he can get. Well, these men hated Christ, and they were up late at night on their busiest time of the year, and they still found time to destroy him or to attempt to destroy him because they hated him so much. His hatred was, their hatred was so real. That they are willing to give up their sleep tells me how much they hated them or hated him. And with this scene, Peter is following in verse 58. 
Sanhedrin was dozens of men who gathered. It was the Supreme Court of Israel, and they're going into the courtyard here, and Peter following him, was following him, verse 58, at a distance as far as the courtyard of the high priest, and going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Peter is torn here. He's following from a distance. He's torn between fear and faithfulness. Peter wants to be near to Christ, but he doesn't want to be so near that it costs him. That's why he's following at a distance. He, he still possesses in the depths of his heart this desire to be faithful to his Savior, but it's, he does not, he's not ready yet to pay the ultimate price, and so he follows from a distance. He's basically a halfway Christian at this point. From a distance. And I think this probably represents a lot of you. Maybe. Perhaps. You want enough Christianity just to be, have a sense that you're near to Jesus, but you don't want so much Christianity that it actually costs you something. How many people like that? How many people like Peter right here? I think the church world is, is littered with it. There's a whole bunch of people that, that want to follow Jesus just close enough so they can feel like they're Christians. And I, and I honestly think Peter at this point actually feels like he's, he's being faithful. I don't think he's realized what's happened. And so he's got this, he's, he probably has this inner sense of peace that things are okay. And, and so he's following him at a distance, but he's yet a little leery. He doesn't want to get too close because the minute he gets too close, then he's one of those extreme Christians. You know, the, time, the kind that show that they're actually born again. Peter doesn't want, he's not there. He doesn't want to go there. And this might represent some of you. You want enough Christ to feel like you're a Christian, but you don't want so much Christ to identify with him and it costs you something. How many people like that? Oh, there's so many like that. But let me tell you, there's no halfway to Christ. It's either all or nothing. You're either with him or you're against him. And trying to be the halfway Christian, Peter ends up with the wrong crowd, and this is the way it happens. People become halfway Christians because they want to stick with the old crowd. You know, I'll be, I'll be the Christian with the old crowd. I won't be the Christian that identifies with Christ. I'll be the Christian with the old crowd. Look at what he does. And Peter was following him at a distance. We already talked about that. As far as the courtyard of the high priest... And going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. He's more comfortable with the servants of Satan than the servants of Jesus Christ. These men are servants of Satan. They are the servants. As the, the word can be translated servants. These are the servants who care for and do the bidding of the high priest. The, the type of people who went and captured Christ in Gethsemane. These are the certain servants of Belial, the servants of Satan, the servants of the darkness. And, and Peter, he, he, he wants to feel like he's a Christian. He wants to feel like he's close to Jesus. So he follows him at a distance, but he's most comfortable sitting down with the servants of Satan. This is very dark. And it's very evil. He was more comfortable with the servants of Satan than he was being close to Jesus. He wanted to keep his distance from Jesus, but he was okay sitting down right beside and having fellowship with the servants of Satan. And there's so many people around today, and what they say is, well, Jesus spent time with the drunkards and the prostitutes. Why can't I? Yeah, when Jesus was with the drunkards and the prostitutes, he was calling them out for their sin. And he was bringing them out of darkness. Well, Peter here is stepping into darkness. And you want to go to the parties, and you want to go to the raves, and you want to go where people are smoking dope? Well, guess what? You're just like Peter here. You might think in your heart that you're a Christian, but you're not identifying with Christ. I'm following him from a distance. Peter's deceived himself. I think he actually thinks things are okay at this point in time. They're not okay. They're terribly wrong. And the minute you start going down this direction, the minute it, that's, it's all over. Charles Spurgeon commented, and he said, when a servant of Christ has his own choice, by his own choice, sits with the servants of the wicked, sin and sorrow speedily follow. John Trapp said, evil company is a contagion, or it's contagious, and sin more catching than the plague. John Trapp lived at a time when there actually were plagues circulating. He understood a thing or two about them. When the plague came into town, people just started dropping dead. 40, 50, 60% of the town dies. 
It's contagious, a real contagion. And this is the way it works. If you're following Jesus from a distance, what's happening is, is you are, you're catching the contagion, and it's more contagious than the plague. Halfway Christians find more camaraderie with non-Christians than full Christians, and they end up no Christians. It's a dark road. Who are you hanging out with? Who are you spending your time with? Whose company do you enjoy the most? If it's the company of the people that tell you the truth, the people that walk in holiness, the people that make you feel a little bit uncomfortable because, because they've forsaken sin and they're full-way Christians, then that tells me something. But if, if your, comp- your, your company you're most comfortable with is the ones that are servants of Satan, then there's a serious problem with your soul. You've caught the contagion. Who are you hanging out with? Who you want to date? Who are you attracted to? Who who are the people that you enjoy being around? You know, I I, kind of wish, having looked at this text and parked myself here now for a few minutes, I kind of wish I just preached a whole sermon on this one little text. This is so serious. And you say, why are you getting so worked up about this? Because I see it happen again and again and again and again. How many times have I seen this happen? Oh, somebody wants to be the halfway Christian. Oh, I'm not going to take my Christianity. That's how I'm going to be a good witness in the world. And then all of a sudden, oh, all of a sudden they're sitting down with the servants of Satan. And then all of a sudden they're acting like the servants of Satan. And all of a sudden their world starts caving in. And then all of a sudden I hear about it and I'm praying for you. And ready to help you put it back together. And point you to the Lord. I've been here 13 and a half years. You know how many times I've seen this? Why do I get so worked up about this? Because I know what it does. I know the destruction it brings. I know the terror it brings to homes and families and people and lives. When I want to be the halfway Christian because I think it's okay. And they're in control and they can get away with it. I'll tell you something, you won't get away with it. Because it's a spiritual disease that you've caught. And the only way out of it is to become a full way Christian. To fully embrace Jesus Christ. And this is the scene. This is the scene. It's a dark scene. Be a halfway Christian, leave that halfway Christian life now and become a full way Christian. Become to Jesus Christ. You say, well, I already have. Well, if you're following him from a distance and you're sitting down with the sons of Satan, then no, you're not showing the fruit of the Spirit of God. No, you're not. Thankfully, God redeemed Peter. He came out of it. He was restored after his backsliding, but he never redeemed Judas. And if you're in the middle of being the halfway Christian sitting down with the sons of Satan, you don't know whether you're a Peter or a Judas yet. And you might not find out until it's too late. So come back now and show that you're a Peter. But Peter did. This is the scene. Jesus on trial with the Sanhedrin late at night and Peter walking from a distance, sitting down with the sons of Satan. That's the scene. It's a dark scene. Jesus is all on his own. Our Savior has been abandoned. Nobody is with him. And he's sitting in front of the power brokers. And and the power brokers have a goal. You know what the goal is? This is my next point. They have a goal, an objective. They want a guilty verdict. They want a guilty verdict. This is not a real trial, friends. It's a fake trial. It's a show trial. It's pure pageantry. It's all religious and political and legal theater. They've not convened to find the truth, but they've only convened to shut Jesus up. That's the only reason they convened. And there's a lot of people like this. They come under the pretense of finding the truth, but really the only reason that they've gathered or that they come is because they want to find a way to shut Jesus up and silence the inconvenient noises that keep going off in their consciences. That's too much of a bother for them. And so they want to find a reason to kill him. Verse 59. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking a false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Like this is an effort they're putting into this. And giving the money that's already exchanged hands and has provoked Judas, 
the 30 pieces of silver, we shouldn't be surprised if some of these witnesses were hired for the job. As they're running through the list of witnesses. How many of these witnesses were hired for the job? How many of them? Well, I don't know. But when you have a corrupt society, a society that's this corrupt, there's probably a lot of them. In fact, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 12 says, if a ruler listens to falsehood, all his officials will be wicked. Every one of them. So, so there's an immediate application to our own society. Our, you know, how many lies do our rulers listen to? And that tells me a little bit of something about the hearts of our rulers and the hearts of the people that work in high office in this country. The overwhelming majority are corrupt to the bone and beyond, right down into the marrow. These types of people, how many of them hire false witnesses, false experts, false people who are okay lying for a couple bucks over and again, over and again? And that's what's happened here. They need some false witnesses. And they're unsuccessful, however, which proves the innocence of Christ, even with all these liars they've gathered around them. They're terribly unsuccessful because look at what it says, but they found none. Verse 60, they found none. Though many false witnesses, I don't know how many is, but it's a lot, came forward. They found none. They're unsuccessful. It demonstrates the innocence of Christ. They, they, they had all this power. They had all this money, all this following, all these people that, that basically want to be a bunch of sycophants around them. And they can't find a false witness or a witness that can stand at least. So Jesus is innocent. But then two witnesses come forward at the end of verse 60. Two false witnesses come forward. At last, two came forward, verse 61, then verse 61, and said, This man said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to rebuild it in three days. They paint him basically as a domestic terrorist and are a sorcerer. You have this beautiful edifice, the temple, that's taken so many years to build, and it's this prominent feature in Jerusalem up on a mountain. And what they've done is they've said that Jesus says he can tear it down in three days and build it up again. So they're painting him as either an enemy of the state, okay, an enemy of the temple, or a sorcerer, or maybe both, but one or the other. And what they've done is they've taken what he's said about the resurrection and they've twisted it because how many times in the Gospel of Matthew has he said that he'll rise after three days? Chapter 12, verse 40, chapter 16, verse 21, chapter 17, verse 23, chapter 20, verse 19. They've taken what he said about the resurrection and they've twisted it to make it sound like he's talking about the temple in Jerusalem. They're taking that little wee statement there and pinning it on him, you know. He said it, he said it, he said it, he said it. But they're frivolous claims and they know it. They're absolutely frivolous. It's pure folly, it's a waste of time, it's a waste of energy, it's a waste of words. These claims mean absolutely nothing. And the high priest manufactures a bunch of excitement and stands up and he demands an answer after these, you know, charges come forward that Jesus says he's gonna tear down the temple or he says he can tear down the temple and raise it up in three days. The high priest gets really excited in verse 62 and the high priest stood up Right? And said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? Like, this is all manufactured. We know these guys are hypocrites. And this is courtroom drama, courtroom hypocrisy, courtroom acting. It's total political theater. And Jesus, Jesus is, like, you got to understand, he's seeing all of this from a heavenly perspective. And so he knows it's all nonsense. So he's sitting back, he's removed himself from the situation because he sees it for what it is, and what it is is a show trial, it's a, it's a fraud. And he's sitting back, and verse 62 tells us that he remains silent. I'm sorry, verse 63 says, but Jesus remains silent. And I would think that that would just make the high priest irate because he wants him, he's trying to pump him for information. And, and he's thinking, look, I got all these guys around me, you got the military, all this pageantry, you know, it, it think, you think the situation would at least pressure something out of Jesus that would, um, you know, indict him. But it doesn't. He just sits there silent because he knows these are frivolous charges. These are just trumped up nonsense charges that mean nothing. And, and I, can, I, I mean, the text doesn't say that 
But you can almost, you kind of imagine it maybe. Jesus is sitting there. He's taking all of these dumb allegations, all this nonsense that these guys are muttering out, and, and he's completely silent. He just stares at them. And I wonder if he just raised his eyebrow for a second too. Really, guys? Really? You know, you never said really. But he stared them down, and he, he wasn't even phased. He's so focused on his mission, and he can see right through all of the smoke that's being blown. And he won't say anything. So now, sometimes there's a time to speak, and sometimes there's a time to remain silent. This was a time to remain silent because the charges were so frivolous, it's not even worth answering. And sometimes it's, that's the way it is. People say such nonsense about you. It's not even worth responding to. But he does respond eventually. You go on a little further. Verse 63. Jesus remains silent, okay. And then the chief priest is getting frustrated. Weak charges. And then you can see the frustration boiling over in the high priest in verse 63 at the end of it. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. So when he says, I adjure you by the living God, he's trying to invoke the language of oath. And so he's trying to bring Jesus under an oath to, to make a point. And he's, in one sense, he's trying to manipulate his conscience by invoking the name of God here. And, and godless people will do this if you haven't noticed. If godless people want to get what they want out of God's people, they will try to manipulate their consciences. They have no consciences, the, the godless do, but they know that the righteous do, and so they'll try to manipulate their consciences. So I think that's, he's trying to do that with this, I adjure you by the living God's talk. It's amazing how they do this. Verse 63 goes on. And he says, tell us if you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And so Jesus has been quite quiet about this, this the Christ, the son of the living God. In fact, really the only time I think we've heard this phrase, the Christ, the son of the living God, is Peter in verse 16 of chapter 16, is Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus acknowledges that he is so. And then in verse 20, Peter, Jesus tells the disciples to, to you know, put a lid on it. Don't talk about it. Because at that point in time, it wasn't time for him to be crucified. And so in chapter 16, verse 16, Peter acknowledges that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus says, you know, don't talk about it in verse 20 to the 12 disciples because they kind of heard the confession. But then here comes the exact same phrase out in the Sanhedrin trial. Now, do, you, do anyone want to guess how that confession made its way to the Sanhedrin when Jesus told the 12 men who heard it back in chapter 16 to be quiet? So, so back in chapter 16... Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So I, don't, I don't think it's ever said again in Matthew like that. It's the exact same phrase. All the disciples hear it, all 12 of them. Jesus says, keep your lips closed. Don't talk about it because it wasn't time for him to die yet. But now this statement, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, has somehow leaked out of the 12 and it's surfacing in the Sanhedrin. How do you think that happened? Well, there's that little sneaky rat. Judas, that little weasel, he's, he's, he's revealing all the secrets here. There's a little weasel that made his way into the Sanhedrin, and for 30 pieces of silver, he's given them all the information they want. And so who's the one that's the source of these charges against Christ, that he's the son of the living God, the Christ, that he's made these claims about himself, but that little weasel, Judas, the traitor? Well... Anyway, it's not like it's a really serious accusation because he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I mean, they saw the triumphal entry, right? That's a claim to being Christ. They saw the children singing about him in the temple. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He called down the woes on the Pharisees. He taught them in the temple. He overturned the tables in the temple. He said that his, that's his house. The temple, his father's house. And so they're, they're bringing this judgment down or this indictment down against Christ. 
But what they're indicting him for is who he is, and that's the Christ, the Son of the living God, which is the irony of the whole thing. They can't find anything on him. You think they could find at least one? They're nothing. And so what they have to indict him for is this, finally, they've, been, they've had this card in their back pocket, and they pull the card. You know, we know what's going on here, because Judas gave us the inside information. Here's the statement you made. Look out. And now we got you. And he told them to keep a lid on it. Well, apparently Judas didn't. So now Jesus has to answer their question. Verse 64, Jesus said to him, you have said so. Now, some people, some people come to the trial of Christ and they're like, see, Jesus kept silent. Jesus kept silent. Jesus kept silent. We shouldn't answer allegations against us. Jesus kept silent. No, he kept silent on one charge. The stupid, frivolous one. But, but when it came to the charge that he's the Christ, the son of the living God, do you see what he does? They say, is it, yep, it's true. He's not afraid of them. And then beyond that admission that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, he actually pronounces judgment upon them. Verse 64, but I tell you from now on, you will see the son of man seated in the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. That's a pronouncement of judgment. Let me talk about that before I elaborate on this section a little bit more. But this is referring to Christ coming in judgment. When he refers to himself as the son of man, that's the exalted Messiah of Daniel 7. We've talked about this. Seated at the right hand of power. That means continuing on in his exalted state. Resting in his rule at the right hand of power means he is exalted over all the nations. He is the power of God. And then coming here, coming in the, in the clouds of glory or the clouds of heaven is referring to not the parousia, the second coming, but it's the general word for coming. And it means he's coming in judgment. And in fact, it's a repetition of what occurred um, in chapter 24, verse 30 in the Olivet Discourse where he talks about coming in the clouds of heaven in, in judgment. And the clouds of heaven is always the language of judgment in the Bible. It was a language of judgment on Saul in 2 Samuel 22, 10 through 11. It was a language of judgment on Egypt in Isaiah 19, verse 1. And Jesus says, you're going to see the judgment of God, essentially. Do you understand what happened in this trial now? Look, you're looking at it. You're looking at it. And you're thinking, Jesus is on trial. But Jesus is looking at it, and he's saying, no, 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 no. These guys are on trial, and he just pronounced the judgment. They're the ones that are on trial. And, and their judgment is coming very, very, very soon. And by the way, one of the criticisms that got leveled against us so many times, and we were getting all kinds of heat a few years ago, is, well, why are you, why are you saying so much? But, yeah, but if, you, if you actually go back and you listen to the things that we were saying, what were we saying? Jesus is worth it. Jesus is the Christ. And judgment's going to fall upon our political leaders if they don't repent. What do you think he's saying right here? He's simply saying that he is the Christ. He is ultimate authority. He's the one that gets to decide things. And those who refuse to acknowledge it will be judged. And they'll watch it happen with their own eyes. It, hey, Every verdict that we need to know about has now been made. It's been rendered. And the, they've, these guys have come out of this trial guilty. You will see, Jesus says, they will see the witnesses, or they will witness their own destruction and demise. And this is talking about the destruction that will come upon Jerusalem in 70 AD. As it was, the same phrase was used in the Olivet Discourse. The destruction that's going to fall upon Jerusalem, they are going to witness it. Their children are going to witness it. The Romans are going to come in. They're going to burn the city to the ground, and it's going to be a bloodbath. And then they'll know that Jesus was right. And when we stand before people in this world, and they want to put Jesus on trial, or they want to put righteousness on trial, we can stand, and we can be, just, we can be Christ-like just like this, and we can assert the supremacy of Jesus Christ, and if those who are in authority would like to rule against his righteousness, then there is a cost to be paid by them. And it will come. And just as, as Jesus was vindicated in 70 AD for his words, so he will be vindicated uh, as, it, as it pertains to the judgment that will come upon those people who reject his rule. It will happen in our own society. The judges and the prosecutors that want to put us on trial and the politicians, that have, the media that have tried to shame us. And it will happen again and again and again throughout the history of the church. Those people who will not bend the knee to Jesus, he will break their knees if he has to. But he'll do it. 
and they will pay with judgment. It's never righteousness that's on trial. It's never Christ that's on trial. The entire world is on trial right now. And those who refuse to repent already stand under the curse. The indictment's been made. And, and, you know, let's just, let me just picture him standing before the court. They ask him if he's the Christ as if that's somehow supposed to embarrass him. And, and he's like, yep, I'm the Christ. <laughs> and not only does he admit it, he says, and you're going to pay. Judgment's coming and you're going to watch it. You see how unintimidated he is with these people? Because he's removed himself from the situation so that he can see it from a heavenly perspective through the eyes of faith. And he knows exactly what's going on in the heavenly realm. And this is how we should see the world. He's never on trial. His righteousness is never on trial. His law is never on trial. People only delude themselves into thinking that it is. They're on trial. And every one of their actions is being recorded. Everyone, no, no, watch, just, just to emphasize this a little bit more. Well, let's look at verse 64 again. Jesus said to him, you have said so, but I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And you see how many times the word you is spoken? Three times. See? You have said so, that's his admission that he's the Christ. But I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man. So the word you... You don't see this in the English text. You see it in the Greek. The word you in verse 64 is you singular because he's answering the, the chief priest directly. It's a direct answer to the chief priest. The chief priest is asked, tell us if you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So he answers him directly, looks him in the eyes and says, you have said so. But now he's got a captive audience. And so as you probably have guessed by now, the next uses of the word you are not you singular, but are you plural. And so his indictment, his pronouncement of judgment is upon the entire Sanhedrin that everyone that's, that's listening to him. And he, he basically stands up and he's like, hey, I got a captive audience. I'm preaching another sermon. And that's exactly what he does. But I tell you, plural, all of you's. From now on, every single one of you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of judgment. You're all going to pay. You're going to pay a price for what you're doing right now, you dirty dealers, you. That's, that's how it's going. So he answers the high priest directly, and then he turns his sights on them all and basically goes into a sermon, and it's a hellfire and brimstone sermon. For those of you who don't like those types of sermons, that's what it was. And they came in looking for a guilty verdict. They think they got one because he admitted he's the Christ. <gasps> Big surprise. We all knew that. The best they can do is to get him to admit who he actually is. But he is unmoved by their power. He's unmoved by their shenanigans. He's unmoved by the mock trial. And he renders the most important verdict of the entire day. And that's that every single last one of them is guilty and they're going to pay. When the world judges us with their man-made rules for being Christian and holding to Christian convictions, we learn from Jesus here. We cannot be intimidated. We must see it through the eyes of faith. And we must be absolutely clear in what we believe. And when the world stands in judgment over us, we must remind them that Christ stands in judgment over them. And what about you? Where do you stand as it relates to God? You come to church today thinking you're standing in judgment over Christ? Oh, this Christianity thing, man, they're such a bunch of narrow-minded bigots. They, they don't teach me like my teachers teach me, who are so much more enlightened than 2,000 years of Christianity. I mean, my teacher can't tell the difference between a boy and a girl, but man, they're so enlightened. <laughs> right? You know, it talk how many, oh, I guess they think it's, you know, how far did we have to evolve from, um, uh, from the fish or the monkeys to realize that boys aren't girls? You know, I mean, I don't know, billions and billions of years it took us to evolve to this point where a boy is not a boy and a girl is not a girl. Really, the enlightened people think this is a bunch of hogwash and they guess, okay, fine. 
No problem. And if you want to come to church and, and this is your view of Jesus and you're standing in judgment over, you know, all these hard statements that he's making and his standard of righteousness and you figured that you're more enlightened than him, no problem. That's your choice. But just remember the pronouncement here. You're, he's not on trial. You are. And the day will come when you pay. But right now he offers you free grace because he's a loving Savior. So why don't you come to Jesus today and just repent all that nonsense? And embrace him and receive your full pardon for your sin. Get the, like, it's right there waiting for you. Why don't you come? Why don't you come to Jesus? Don't be like these guys. Don't stand in judgment over him. Delude yourself into thinking you're judging Christ. When really you're the one on trial. And you'll pay if you don't repent. But yet right now he's giving you full pardon. Come. Be pardoned. Be forgiven. By the blood of Jesus. Well, anyway, that's the scene and, and that's the goal. The goal is to find a guilty verdict. They think they got it. And, and then now pay attention to the, to the reaction. Whoa, the reaction. Good golly, this reaction they get. Oh, he, he said, you know, the, the social media, social justice mob just lit up. I mean, I'm telling you, these people... They just jump on them like you wouldn't believe the, ra the rage mob has been let out of hell. Verse 65, then the high priest tore his robes. <laughs> he, this is a joke. The tearing of the robes is a sign of offense. He's not offended. He's happier than a pig rolling around in poo right now. He got what he wanted. He's thinking he's offended. He's not offended. It's all show. It's, it's all hypocrisy. It's all theater. The whole thing's theater. But, oh, I'm so offended. Right. I'm sure you are. He got, he's just, he's, on the outside, he looks offended. On the inside, oh, how dare he talk that way. On the inside, it's like, yeah, got it. Let's get him. Right? Mission accomplished. The fake outrage. Verse 65, then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. Oh, blasphemy, okay. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard this blasphemy, right? Blasphemy. Right. You can almost hear him em em emphasizing blasphemy. He says it two times. I think that's intentional. They're getting all worked up over blasphemy. But here's the blasphemy is to speak against God, to speak against his temple, to speak against his rulers. That's what they would have considered it. And they would have considered blasphemy to be worthy of death. And so the high, priests, the high priest asks what their judgment is, and they answer. So he, he's out, he mock, fake, acting outrage over the blasphemy. And then, and then he goes on, and he says to the group, he turns to the group, and he, and he says, what is your judgment? In verse 66, and they answered, he deserves death. Well, of course he does. You already figured that when you got in there. What do you expect them to say? This is what they wanted all along. And they figure they got him now. Mission accomplished. This is all rehearsed. They got to have the trial to make it look like there's a trial, but there's no trial here. And by the way, in a civilized society, after a conviction of guilt, the bailiff usually gently escorts the guilty party towards his sentence, whatever his sentence is. There's usually, there's usually a level of, um, of protocol, right? There's a, there's a way to do this. There's a peaceful way to take the guilty party out. And whatever he's going to receive, whether it's a death sentence or he's going to prison or he's got to pay a fine, there, there's usually a very sedated I guess, dignified way of handling the guilty party. But when, when Jesus is pronounced guilty by the entire Sanhedrin, I hope you understand that it's just basically all hell breaks loose, and then you all of a sudden see out in the open what's been going on inside the heart. This is the rage mob of rage mobs. These are a bunch of children having temper tantrums. You know, they, they look like men, but... The, look, then he, he deserves that. Verse 16, then they spit in his face? Like, when does that happen in court? And struck him, and some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck? This is hell. I hope you see that. This isn't a dignified to, way to handle a trial or a verdict. All of, like, like, basically, this pronouncement that he's guilty and he deserves to die, like, they basically opened up hell and they just came out. 
And so all the hell is breaking loose now. The spitting was a show of contempt. It's disgusting. The striking, the first strike was the fist. The slapping is, can either be translated slapping with an open-handed slap or hitting him with a club, one or the other. I mean, they had clubs. And then in verse 68, they mock him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ, <laughs> who is it that struck you? It's just hell has been unleashed. Wait, this is so dark, so evil. These guys are so fake. And Jesus is just sitting there watching the whole thing go down from a heavenly perspective. He took it all. He took it all. He knows he's innocent. He knows judgment is coming on these guys. He knows, he knows what's going to happen to them. He knows their verdict has been read. He knows that their trial is a farce. But you know what else he knows? He knows he's got a job to do. He knows God's given him a job. And the job is submit to it, go, die, and redeem a people for himself. And so he takes it. But do you see how focused he was for us? For us, for you. For you who are the redeemed of God. He was focused on you. He saw right through this whole thing. He says, I've got a mission. And do you see how much he loves us? The love of Christ for his people here. And you see his courage as he faces all of this head on and submits to the entire process because he knows that this is what he was born for. As he goes to the cross. And, and do, do you see how worthy he is of our worship and love and affection? How lovely Christ is? Do you see how worthy he is? He receives it all for us. He's emerged from Gethsemane as what? He's emerged from Gethsemane as our champion our champion. Nobody else would do it. So he did it. And all his friends have forsaken him. And he takes on all of our sin by himself is our holy, righteous, all-powerful, courageous, and faithful champ. That's Christ. So I hope as you sing to him and as you worship him, you worship one who you know and truly believe is worthy. And you treasure him above all else because he is worthy. He died for us. He was focused on our redemption.